Amen. And the Lord is worthy of all the shouts that we would give to Him. Amen. Amen. Well, I love those uh, songs that uh, just uh, speak directly uh, to the Lord. It's those ones that gives us dialect. It's not really so much as a song as it is as a prayer to music. Amen. Amen. That we can uh, have that, that prayer and to be speaking to the Lord and to give Him thanks and, and, and make those proclamations to the Lord like what we heard in that song. Forever we'll love Him, forever we'll stand. Amen. Yeah. A few announcements this morning. We'll continue on into uh, worship this morning. Uh, I want to remind everyone that this Wednesday night, uh, this coming Wednesday, December 21st, excuse me, 21st, the kids will be passing out uh, fruit baskets and praying for those recipients and also having a, a time of singing uh, Christmas carols also. And so if you would uh, like to help with uh, donations or maybe uh, you would like to help in the making of those baskets to be given out. Uh, if you would, uh, please uh, see Rita Gately or uh, Kelly Rogers, and they can uh, give you some more information about that. Uh, Tuesday night will be uh, a testimony night. Uh, as usual, the snacks are going to start at 6 o'clock, and the meeting is going to be at 6.30. Uh, we have the uh, joy of uh, Scott Hevner being here to uh, share his testimony with us on Tuesday night. So on uh, uh, encourage you if you can all come and uh, to hear his testimony and to uh, support and encourage him. And uh, Operation Christmas Child, as we mentioned previously, we'll be picking that back up at the first of the year. Uh, come January, we'll uh, be making those announcements of the uh, the first items that we will be pick, taking up on the new year. Uh, I do want to continue to throw the pitch out there for our Connect cards that we've got. Uh, I do ask that you, if you would to fill those out for us. Um, one thing I do want to point out, we've noticed that a few folks have kind of gotten in the habit of uh, filling them out as soon as they come in and immediately throw them in the box. We would ask that if you will to kind of hang on to them uh, because there's always those times that uh, you may have a question or a comment or uh, we may have someone here with us that may uh, make a decision for Christ and may want to note that on there before turning those in. So. Uh, if you would, please fill out the cards for us, hang on to them, and uh, turn them in at the end of the service. Just as you go out, there's a little blue box on the side, and you just drop them straight in there. Uh, if you can do that for us, it would greatly appreciate us. It will help us to um, better keep uh, track of, of who's here, not just for tracking purposes. It helps us to better minister to all of you, um, you know, if there's circumstances that arise or if there's needs that you may have that we can keep noted in there. All right, I think that's all the announcements we have, so let's uh, go, Lord, in prayer, and we'll uh, continue on into our worship service this morning. Great Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise you, Father, Lord, for being in your house once again, Father. Lord, you have granted us the grace uh, to have the strength and the health and the ability to be here today, Father. Lord, we know that all who are here, Father, is div divinely appointed by you, Father. Lord, what a blessing it is to, uh, to be here, to, Lord, to, to just corporately worship you and to receive your word. And Father, I just pray as we do so, your spirit would work amongst us, Father. Lord, and bring us to a place, Father, where we are prepared to be ministered unto you, Father. Lord, may the, the, the power and the strength and the anointing of your word, Father, Lord, um, bring about change in us, Father. Lord, I ask that your word would encourage us and build us up in wisdom and strength, Father, Lord, in boldness, Father, Lord, to faithfully live for you in this world, Father. Lord, I just give you um, uh, thanksgiving, Father. I give you praise for what you're going to do in this place, Father. Lord, as we praise you and worship you through song, as we praise and worship you through the receiving of your word, may everything that be done in this place today, Father, all be done for your honor, for your glory, and your praise. In the name of Jesus that we pray, amen. All right, stand with me and let's continue to worship. I'm 
Just a second. Where are you podium? Yeah, I think I killed my, my mic. Where are you podium? We'll try uh, we'll try this one for now. So every time I go to reach that on button, I pop that little compartment and it makes the batteries come loose and it didn't come back on for some reason. But that's okay. Mike or no Mike, word will go forth. Amen. If I could have the uh, children to come forward, please. There they come. Now the flood break breaks forth. Yeah. Sounds like Hannah had something she wanted to share with the church this morning, so. We just thank you that you were playing, praying for me this morning, and we just appreciate it. And this, and this morning, by the day or two, I started waking up, like, feeling a lot more better than I usually do. Praise God! Amen. And we do thank you of your uh, prayers. I uh, have a uh, testimony to share with you in regards to that uh, uh, a little bit Lord, uh, after the message for this morning. Amen. So we thank the Lord for all these precious ones that we have here uh, with us today. And uh, we'll take this time as we always do. Thank the Lord for them and uh, thank Him for uh, the blessings and the, the, the ministering of His Word to them. So if you will, uh, please join with me. Let's go Lord prayer. Uh, ask His blessings over them and our tithes and offerings. Great Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise you and we thank you for these wonderful and lovely children that we have here, Father. Lord, we thank you for what you're going to accomplish in them, Father, as the, 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 the power of your word is spoken unto them. Lord, I pray that you anoint the teachers, anoint the children, Father. Lord, for your word to be spoken and for your word to be heard today. Lord, personalize that message for each one of them as only you can, Father. Touch them in such a special way, Father, Lord, that they may see your exceeding great love for them, Father that their love may exceedingly grow towards you, Father. Lord, that that love would grow in faith and trust and obedience unto you uh, all the days of their life. Father, we ask your blessings over our tithes and offerings. Lord, we commit this day to give to you as an act of worship, praising you and thanking you for being sovereign over us, Lord, and lovingly providing for all of our needs, Father. Lord, may our joy and thanksgiving in, in um, uh, uh, our tithes and offerings be pleasing to you. May you multiply it and, and use it to, uh, for your honor, your glory, and your purpose in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Got your Bibles? Maybe uh, you still got your bookmark there with us. Romans chapter 1, looking at verses 5 through 7. 
Romans chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. And uh, today we're going to continue on to the next couple of verses into uh, Romans. Uh, we're going to try to finish up uh, Paul's introduction and, uh, and continue to dig a little deeper into the, the meat of the message that uh, uh, Paul had written for the Roman church or for, for those at Rome. But God has written for us. Amen. Amen. And uh, like I said, you know, we're, we've just gone through the introduction, but man, as I mentioned before, Paul is, uh, was uh, uh, through the divine inspiration of the, the Holy Spirit, uh, packed so much truth in even just his introduction to the, the Romans that there was so much to, to get out of that today. And so we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 7. And kind of like last Sunday, we looked at the... Um, that word grace. And we saw how important that one particular word is. And today, we're going to be looking at that word obedience. It's going to be the kind of like what they used to do in Sesame Street when I was little, the, the word of the day. So, uh, <laughs> let's go Lord and uh, let's, uh, uh, let's uh, read Romans chapter 1 verses 5 through 7 and uh, ask the Lord to uh, minister His word unto us today. And uh, we'll see what, 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 uh, what the good Lord has in store for us. Uh, so Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 5, it says, Through Him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for His name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. If you will, let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we bless your holy name today. And we give thanks unto you for the mighty anointing of your word. Father, we thank you, Father, Lord, how your word so consistently and effectively accomplishes what you purpose it. Father, your word needs nothing today. Before, Father, me as a speaker need everything. Lord, for my words aren't graceful. And Lord, my deliverance, Father, is not of the highest quality. And Father, even of ourselves, Father, our understanding, Father, is so limited apart from you. But Father, in my weaknesses, in our weaknesses, you are made strong. And Father, I pray, Lord, that the strength of your word be magnified through this weak vessel today, Father, to speak your word. Lord, may your word be magnified unto all of us, Father. Lord, may the power of your spirit, Father, personalize this message, Father. Lord, that you would bring understanding, Father. Lord, that you would bring edification, Father. Lord, that you would bring conviction, if it so needs, Father, to accomplish your good and perfect purposes that your word always does fulfill when it goes out. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we look into these few verses here, uh, one of the things that I want to just go ahead and speak out from the forefront that we see here is that uh, there's kind of two parts that uh, that are that I pray are projected out uh, in uh, the message of these two scriptures today? Is one how there is a calling that those who that we at one point, if you're believers in Jesus Christ, if you're born again believers here today, that there was a time where there was a calling upon your life. And there was an answering to that call, that call of Christ. But after that call came, and salvation came as a result of that call and that answering of that call, there was a command that was given. And that there was uh, an obedience to that faithful answering of that call of Christ that comes along with that. So a couple of things that I pray that we would see today is how there is that calling upon our life, a calling unto salvation, but when there is that calling, that answering of that call unto us uh, that, uh, that comes through faith, that that faith leads to an obedience 
to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So as we've done in the past, uh, let's just kind of take this and break these, a few of these important uh, words that we see in these verses down to kind of look for a, a little bit of a better context and understanding of what Paul is uh, speaking here in essence what God is speaking to us today. So last week we saw that first part of verse 5, through Him we have received grace. And we spoke of that word grace. But the next word that we see after that we'll start looking at this morning is that word apostleship. Now, this apostleship comes through Jesus Christ. And I wanted to kind of clarify a little bit of misunderstanding about this word apostleship. Because you may even hear this day in uh, some churches and some denominations that they call people apostles. Apostle John, Apostle you know, Paul, who, whoever it may be. We hear that word uh, spoken of today as people refer to as apostles today. Now, if you know a little bit about uh, 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 church history, know a little bit about church theology, theology um, and there may be some controversies that rise up around this word. So I wanted to clarify what this word means and how, what, and, and to kind of apply that to um, the times that we live in today. So when we see that word apostle, there's a couple of different meanings that we see here. We know that we see in the Bible that it speaks of the, the, the gift of an apostle. But it also speaks of an office of apostle. And that word apostle is, is essentially one that is sent or as an authorized delegate. Or it is one who carried the gospel with God's authority. One, a person who has, who has been given God's message to go and to deliver. But there is also, in essence, this position or this office of an apostle. And what this is, is it was an official leader in the early church. So essentially, the, the twelve disciples were apostles. And we see all throughout God's Word, I won't mention them in detail uh, for the sake of the message today, but I can share with you scriptures that, that confirms these particular concepts when it comes to a person holding the office or the person's of an, or, or the position of an apostle. A few of the things that we note in Scripture in regards to an apostle is this. That an apostle was an official leader in the early church. That an apostle was one who spoke with the authority of Christ because they had received direct revelations from the Lord. A person who was an apostle is one who saw Christ firsthand directly. A person who is apostle is one who was taught by Christ, is a person who was sent specifically by Christ. Another thing that's identifying of a person who is apostle is one who has performed many signs and wonders. And all of these things were ones were by far were ones who were accomplished. Uh, uh, all of these things were ones that were um, true of the, especially the, the 12 disciples who were apostles. But there were even others, specifically Paul, who wrote this letter as being an apostle. Because even he himself had firsthand seen the risen Lord Jesus Christ and received direct revelation, direct instructions from the Lord and a direct commission from the Lord himself. Now one thing that I'll say is this, this particular... Um, when we speak of the position or the office of an apostle, this type of apostle is not present in the church today. The apostles were established to build the foundation of the church. And 2,000 years later today, that foundation is not still being built. That foundation is built. There's no longer ones that have seen the Lord firsthand. And, but there is a general sense that we are called to be apostles. We know that we are Christ's ambassadors that we see uh, referred to in Matthew chapter 28 and, and 2 Corinthians uh, verse 5. We know looking at Acts chapter 1 verse 8 that we ourselves are sent ones. And then in Romans 10 we see that we are ones that, that preaches the good news. We preach the message of God, the good news of God to others. 
So there are that rel a lot of those relevances in accordance to the apostles that, that we share. But we are referred to as followers of Jesus Christ, as disciples of Jesus Christ. The closest we have to an apostle that we would see today as far as having that gift of apostleship, we don't specifically call apostles. We call them missionaries. Because missionaries are ones that have been ordained or sent out from the church to go and deliver the message of God, the good news, the gospel of God to those who have not heard this gospel message. But followers of Christ are, are sent as ambassadors to people who haven't heard this good news. Now, apostle is not used to define any office of the church today, uh, and, but there are still some that seek to restore that particular office. And a lot of those that claim this office, they're claiming it because they're seeking to have that equal authority that those original apostles had. And there's this, there's this new age, this, this, this reemergence of not only just apostles, but of prophets also that are trying to reestablish this. And one of the things that I see oftentimes through many people, uh, especially who claim to be a prophet, is, is, is the pushing of this fact that to question them and what they say is to question the divine revelation of God themselves. So it puts them in a position not to be questioned, questioned or not to be doubted. Anyone that comes to you and, and deters you from questioning the truth and accuracy of what they say is a red flag for someone who is potentially not a prophet, but a false prophet, a false teacher. Because even Paul himself commended the people for their diligence in confirming that what he said was the truth of the Word of God. He didn't, Paul, who was an apostle, did not condemn them for verifying the validity of what he had spoken. But for that reason, we, we do not use that word apostle today, especially in that term of what close, most closely fits that, uh, we use that word missionary as one who has, is sent out from a church. Because again, many claim that office of apostle in their desire to seek the authority that either equals or rivals that of actual apostles during that time. And so I felt that it was impossible when we come to that word and look at it to kind of clarify what we see there in, the, um, in this particular verse. The next thing that we see here is what I would speak of is the demand of the gospel. And we see in these next words after that it says, we have received grace and apostleship for what? For obedience to the faith. And we speak of obedience that is produced by faith. When it says for the obedience to the faith, it is speaking of an obedience that is produced or manufactured out of faith. And with that being said, let me tell you this, that true faith, true faith produces obedience in us. Where there is true faith, there is obedience. So when you see that on the opposite, where you see obedience, you see potential signs of true faith. Because a saving faith is an obedient faith. A saving faith is an obedient faith. Faith, in essence, is like the roots of the tree. Where if faith is the root of the tree, obedience is the fruit that is produced out of that tree. What did uh, Jesus say? He talks about, you know, if, if the roots of the tree are bad, then the fruit is going to be bad. And if the fruit is bad, then it's chopped down at the roots and taking up. If you have good roots, you'll have good fruit. If you have good faith, then out of that rooted faith should bring forth fruits of obedience. 
And then that grace is that nourishing water that feeds faith that produces into us obedience. When we see God's grace operating in our life and it feeds our faith, the result of that should be obedience of our faith that is nourished and built up by grace, God's grace that we see. So where there is faith, there is obedience. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 16, it says, Do you not know that whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness? And this may be one for us to... to uh, uh, this is a hard concept for many, especially those who do not believe, to grasp. But every person on earth lives a life of obedience. No matter how rebellious you are, you are still living an actual life of obedience. Because to rebel against one is to obey the other. To rebel against one is to rebel against other. And that's what Romans chapter 6, 16 is telling us here. Do you not know that you... To whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey. And I see two options here. Whether it of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. So, you are either obeying sin or you are obeying Christ unto righteousness. But every person on earth lives a life of obedience. Either it's to sin or or to Christ. So understanding this, uh, it's a multiple choice, 50-50. And the question is this, who is your master? Who has authority over you to command this type of obedience to you? Is sin your master? Is sin your Lord that you obey? Or is Christ the Lord, your Lord. Because there is a payment that each one of these masters provides those that are obedient to it, or in essence, its slaves, as we had spoke of at the beginning. You know, Paul called himself a bondservant of Christ. He was a slave of Christ. He was obedient unto Christ. And there were wages that are paid for him being an in, obedient slave of Christ. Again, we have two options. We can be a slave of sin, obedient to sin, or slaves of Christ and obedient to Christ. And we know what the wages of sin is. For the wages of sin is death. So if sin is your slave master, the one that you obey, the wages that you receive from that obedience is death. Amen. But Christ... And His goodness pays His slaves, those that are obedient to Him, with righteousness. Romans chapter 6 and verses 17 and 18. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin and the obedience of sin... You became slaves of righteousness. And I want to point out in these verses here where it says obedience from the heart. And what we see here is that God gives us a new heart that loves and desires to obey Christ. It's not that Christ is a slave master and forces us into obedience that we have a distaste for. But God gives us a new heart that draws us into a loving desire to be obedient towards Him. And that's what it's talking about here. Yet you obeyed from the heart. When we're free from sin, we become slaves of righteousness. But it is not as of slaves that from a hard slave master. Because we know that Jesus says His yoke is easy and His burden is light. That to be under the the Lordship of Jesus Christ is not a hard and weighty thing. It is a very 
joyful and pleasing thing to be under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But in this, we see that that great demand of the gospel that I was speaking of, the great demand of the gospel is that we would obey Jesus Christ for the rest of our lives. That's what we see when we become followers of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ Himself is the one who reigns over us. Now that doesn't mean that it's just automatic. We still have to mentally decide each and every day to follow Christ. But the important difference is here is now that we have a new heart that gives us those desires to mentally choose to follow Christ each and every day. <coughs> to follow Christ and to be obedient unto Him and to serve Him becomes a desire of us because it is a joyful thing to us and that comes out of that new heart that we have. But again, we do, we must mentally decide each day to follow Christ, but we have that desire to do so. If we are born again and we've been giving a, that heart of stone is taken out of us and that uh, a new heart has been given, we have that heart's desire to obey and follow Christ each and every day. So I say all of that for this understanding here, is that no one is just saved and sits on the sidelines of Christianity. That is a concerning thing to me. Uh, many, uh, there's a term within Christianity in regards to this. It's called easy believism. That all you have to do is just believe. And this where it comes into that false concern is that, you know, someone just goes through the process, repeats a prayer, or does this or does that externally. All you have to do is just speak and say that Jesus Christ is your Lord and it's a done deal. But it's a sad truth, but it's a truth nonetheless that not everyone who professes Jesus Christ possesses Jesus Christ. Because <coughs> Jesus even himself says, you know, that the many of them that cry out, you know, that, uh, you know, they, they cry out to the name of the Lord, but, but Jesus says that he doesn't know them. One of the key things that we see here is that, again, that, that true Faith leads to obedience. And as a result of that, no one is just saved and sits on the sidelines. Believers are actively involved in the Christian life because there is this obedience unto Christ that comes out of a saving faith that we have. Again, as I mentioned, a saving faith is an obedient faith unto Christ. And that obedience unto Christ is seen in our lives. Someone that professes Christ and sits on the sidelines and demonstrates no obedience to Christ leads to question their true faith and trust in Christ. So if I were to tell you that I was part of a football team, but all I ever did is that, that, I, was, that I was on the team, but all I ever did was sit in the stands, am I truly on that team? I may be a fan of that team, but I am not on that team. Who are the ones that are on that team? They're the ones that put on the jerseys. They're the ones that get in the huddle. They're, they are the ones that run the plays that wins the game. They get in there. They run the plays. They fight the fight. They are actively involved. And we are actively involved when we are actively walking in obedience through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. 
So we see here the demand of the gospel. Next, we see the scope of the gospel. And by that I mean who the gospel is broadcasted to. And we see that clearly in these next uh, few verses. Is it says, um, <clears throat> among, uh, it says, obedience to the faith among all nations. The gospel is for every single person on planet earth. Whether a person be living in the Americas, be living in Africa, Europe, Australia, even some of the most remote tribes and parts unknown, the gospel of Jesus Christ is for them also. That's the very reason why we send these missionaries I spoke of previously uh, to places all across the globe. The gospel is for all, for every person in the world, including you and I, in this place today. Now we come to, we see the demand of the gospel, we see the scope of the gospel. These next few words helps us to see the purpose of the gospel. What is the purpose of the gospel going forth today? We see it in these next few words here. To the faith among the nations for what? Or for who? For His name. Or for His name's sake. What the gospel does is it promotes the name and the honor of Jesus Christ so that Jesus Christ would have preeminence above all things. And that word preeminence is just a big fancy word for first. That God, that Jesus Christ would be first in all things. The gospel promotes the name of Jesus, that he would have this preeminence. The gospel doesn't go out so that to help make the churches bigger. It doesn't go out to help to make the churches have a, a better reputation. But even so far as individual churches, the gospel of God does not go out so that denominations can boast about their size or their accomplishments or what they've done. The sole purpose of the gospel is so that there are more voices in that heavenly chorus praising the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for what He had done. God's ultimate goal was to ensure that His death upon the cross is praised and honored as much as it should be. And the work of the gospel is to go out and to do the work of making known the greatness of who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus Christ has done. So that those that hear that may see and know, one, their desperate need of redemption from the consequences of sin in their life. And to see that God, through Jesus Christ His Son, provided that way. And Jesus Christ became that way when He, out of love for us, gave His life for us. Gave His life as a ransom for many. As a ransom for all who are here and are believers in Jesus Christ. It is for His name's sake that we see here. And we see that in uh, Colossians uh, chapter 1 and verse 18. And that He... That is Jesus, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Or that he might be first, that he might be priority in all things. So we see the demand of the gospel, we see the, the, the scope of the gospel, we see the purpose of the gospel. Now I want us to take a look at the success of, of the gospel. It goes on to say, among whom you also are the called. Now this word called here is a very um, um, important word for us to understand. And what it talks about here is called, is talking about the effectual call of Jesus. If I were to call you on the phone, 
there, there's a possibility you may answer or you may, an, may not answer. There is a 50-50 chance of that call being effective, right? So if I call, one or two things are going to happen. Either you're going to answer or you're not. But what this call here is speaking of the effectual call. Now, this word called, I may say this in the Greek wrong, but I believe it's kletos. I looked it up, but, um, but this particular word here, it means one of two things. One, if we call upon somebody, we invite them. You know, it, 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 it speaks of that concept of inviting someone over. But with an invitation, there is an openness for a response to an invitation. If I ask and say, hey, would you like to come over to my house after church? I'm inviting you to my house. And you have the option to accept that invitation or decline that invitation. But this word uh, called in the Greek also has another meaning too. And it's that meaning that we actually see here, and it's this, is a divinely selected and appointed call. And in, in speaking that, let me, uh, let, let's look back at uh, Paul for reference. Was Paul invited by Christ to come Amen. to salvation? Amen. Literally, Jesus kicked him off of his high horse and said, you're mine now, and this is what you're going to do. That is what we call the effective, effectual call of Christ. In other words, the irresistible call of Christ. Like I said, there's one aspect of being invited, but the, but, but the concept of this Greek word that we see here is one who is divinely selected and appointed. When I thought about this, it kind of brings to me the, the concept of um, a warrant that goes out today. So, if I were to commit a crime, what usually happens? They issue a warrant for my arrest, right? And that warrant calling for my arrest goes out. And then what happens after that warrant goes out? They come and they physically arrest me, correct? And then after I am arrested, after I am apprehended, then there is that, what we would call incarceration, that, that, that placing in jail. We are put into a place where we cannot get out. We cannot escape. We have no choice but to be held by that warrant that went out for our arrest. <coughs> and that is what we see through God's drawing of a sinner unto salvation. God calls us. And as we'll see here shortly, there's a couple of means by which that call comes. But when that call comes, that is when that the work of God is being done to draw us unto Him. Now, I mentioned uh, that there, there's, two, there's two calls that we see in our life. One that we see is that external call to Christ that we have. Now, what do I mean by an external call? It's literally as like me standing here saying that if you do not receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the judgment of God weighs upon you. And that judgment is eternal hell and separation for all of eternity. And the only way for the, the penalty and the price of your sin and rebellion against God is through accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That is, in essence, an external call to Christ. It is a call heard from the outside that comes in either through our eyes and what we read or through our ears of what we heard. It's a type of call that would come from Parents can, you know, uh, speaking to their children about accepting Jesus Christ. It may be from preachers, it may be teachers, it may be ministers, it may be witnesses out sharing uh, testimonies or sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
there's that external call to come to Christ. But outside of this external call, there's also an internal call that takes place. And this is that call of God that draws mankind to answer that external call. It is this internal call of God that opens up the eyes and ears and opens up the heart through the offering of a new birth and that granting of repentance and faith. I used to love how our um, uh, Pastor Dwayne often called that. He said that sensation inside is not last night's pizza. <laughs> that in essence, that is the call of Christ. That is when, when God opens up our understanding. He opens up blind. It, it, it's referred to in the Bible as the opening of blinded eyes and the, the softening of hardened hearts. It's where God reveals Himself to us. God, it's His revealing of, of who we are and who we and, and, and reveals our desperate need for Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. There's that internal call that happens. And that external call that may be made is powerless without that internal call. In order for anyone to be to, to in faith receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, there has to be that internal call. And oftentimes that internal call is being worked upon so that when that external call, the heart is prepared so that when Jesus says come, the heart is ready to come. But in John chapter 6 and verse 44, we read, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And that is speaking of that calling, that drawing there. And he goes on to say, I will raise him up at the last day. So here's the thing. I could stand up here today and plead with, with you all day long about how desperately you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That apart from Jesus Christ, there is no salvation, there is no redemption, there is no hope of you escaping God's wrath and, and judgment and punishment for your sin and rebellion. That is only through Jesus Christ and accepting and receiving Him as your Lord and Savior. I can make that call, I can make that petition to you all day long, but until God draws you with that internal calling, there is no... Um, Salvation. There is no um, repentance of faith that can be made. And that's what John 6 is telling us. There. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent draws me to Him. But some think in vain that they can choose the time of their decision. I hear this a lot of times, especially from those who, love, you know, when we're young, we, we think we're semi-immortal, that we're going to live forever. And that time's on our side, that we've got plenty of time. And I even, even with those that are older, we have uh, this debased thinking that, well, you know, I'm going to go and I'm going to enjoy my life and I'm going to do the things that I want to do. And then when I'm done living, living, living life up the way I want to, then I'll, after all that said and done, then I'll, on my timing, decide from that point on to follow Christ. But. It is not of our choosing. It is of God's choosing when He is going to break forth that call in our life to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And until that happens, no one can come to Christ. That call, that drawing must be there. And that's one of the most concerning things that i ever seen in the life of a person is a person who wrestled with this particular thing. There was a, uh, a gentleman that, that, came, that came to church and came to church pretty regularly. And the speaking and the preaching of God's Word opened up his mind to the understanding that he is lost and he is on a path to hell unless he accepts Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And he had come to accept in his mind that he must accept Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior in order to be redeemed and saved 
from that, that judgment and that punishment for his sins. And so out of that head knowledge he had, he came forward and said that he would like to receive Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. And so we knelt down at that altar and we prayed. And I started off in prayer and I just asked him, I said, that you just speak to the Lord and you say what's on your heart. And out of your heart in faith, you go to the Lord and you ask for Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. You, you, you profess that you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And I began that prayer. And as I finished, he started. And he began to pray. And he began to ask. And man, there wasn't just tears that were coming out. There was like, uh, it looked like a, a yo-yo on his nose going. As he was sniffling. And it was, not, it was snot and tears that was pouring out. As he seemingly poured his out, heart out to Christ. And then when the prayer was done, we talked for a little bit. And, I, and, we, and we spoke with him and we asked him how he felt. And he said he felt no difference. The snot and tears that he poured out was the weightiness and the heaviness of him knowing what his fate was. Of him knowing how he needed Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. But that calling him of God was not there. It was just head knowledge, knowing what he needed to do procedurally. He knew in his head, but it wasn't in his heart because God had not given, drawn him and given him that heart that leads to salvation. And he was extremely concerned and worried. And it was a few weeks that went past. But then that calling came. And when that calling came, Salvation came. Redemption came. The newness of life came in Him. And He was so overjoyed. And He was so happy. And so expressive. And just was so anxious to go out there and to share what God had done for them. And then that's when we knew that He had got it. He talked about all the things that... Um, how He had such a desire in His heart to do this differently, to do that differently. You could just see that out of that, that, that faith and that, that new heart that he had came this newness of obedience in his life of things that he no, didn't want, desire to do, but now he had a desire to do because of that new heart that gave him those desires out of becoming a new creature through that saving faith that all resulted from God bringing that draw and that calling <coughs> to Him. There must be this internal drawing and there must be an answer to that call when it comes. So in closing, I just want to share a couple of points with you on this. One, that God gives that external call to all of humanity. And we see God's revelation of this in John chapter 3 and verses 16 and 17. We've heard so many times these verses that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. In verse 17, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. In other words, Jesus Christ, through God's love, sent His Son Jesus. And Jesus died upon that cross so that all who would could be saved. The gospel is available to everyone. That's the good news. But the sad news is that because of mankind's sinful nature and because of mankind's total depravity, there's none that will turn to God without God first impressing upon them. There is no hope of us coming to God unless God directly intervenes in our life to draw us to Him. And we see this happening in the very next verses, John chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, 
because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And listen in verse 19. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. The truth of God came into this world. The Word of God, God's Son, came into this world. But men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. But God impresses him, um, Himself upon those that are called by opening these blinded eyes and softening these hearted hearts that we may see and know our need for Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. God gives grace to see our desperate need for a Savior. And for those that He gives the grace to see, He draws them to the saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And speaking of Jesus Christ, the last part that we see in those opening verses that we started out with, it says, Among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one doing the calling. Jesus is the one that calls and draws us unto Him. And we kind of see that analogy taking place in John chapter 10 and verses 27 through 29. Is, um, in verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and none is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Praise God. Amen. But in verse 27 there, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So in essence, it is though that we hear that internal call where Jesus speaks to us and says our name. I remember there was that time when I was in eighth grade sitting in a living room and I hear Jesus say, Jason. And he called me. If I were to stand here today and I were to say, Silver Fox. I saw a hand up there. If I were to call today and say, Pea Picker, <laughs> he answers over there. Because not everybody may know uh, Wayne or know Jerry well enough to, to, to know those particular names. But they know that name, and I know that name. And when I call that name, it gets their attention and they raise up. But those who Jesus Christ knows, he calls. And those that know Christ answer when He calls. And that's what Jesus Christ does to all of us. We hear that message externally to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, to commit to give our lives to Christ and accept Him as our Lord and Savior. But then when Jesus comes a calling and He speaks our name, he opens up that pathway of understanding. That what we have a mental understanding, we have a heart's understanding of. And we have that choice to answer that call. Just like we see how uh, Jesus speaks here in John 10 of the, the sheep knowing His voice. So with this imagery of the Good Shepherd going to the sheepfold and calling His sheep by name. And here's the thing, that those are not the shepherds. They keep on grazing. They keep on biting at the grass and, and doing what, whatever they're doing in front of them and pay no attention to what's going on. Because, one, their names aren't being called. It's not like, hey, this sheep may be called brown nose or this sheep may be called white ears. You know, hey, brown nose or hey, white ears. Come on, you know, let's go. They've heard themselves being, being called that. They, they know that voice and they answer and they respond. Those that are not His sheep, 
they continue on not knowing the call that was given. But those that hear the shepherd's voice, they respond when the name is called. And when their name is called, they answer and they come to the good shepherd. And the good shepherd takes them and receives them, takes them out of that place that they're on, and he leads them on to greener pastures. And in essence, that's what God does to us. He comes to us and He calls us and He draws us to Him. And when we answer and we come to Him, He takes us out of this uh, bondage and slavery to sin and sets us free. And He delivers us on into those greener pastures where we follow after Him, where we no longer receive the wages uh, of death for our obedience to sinfulness. But now we receive the wages of Christ's righteousness as we follow Him in faithful obedience. And we carry on to there. They are drawn, those sheep are drawn to the shepherd and they're led out to those greener pastures. And with that understanding and that knowing, I ask you this question. Has Jesus called you by name? If He has, have you responded to His call? His call to saving grace. His call to salvation and redemption. My final question to you this morning is this. Is Christ calling you today? Is Christ making it known to you your dire need of a Savior? your dire need to accept Jesus Christ, not just as your Savior, but as your Lord. If you would, please stand with me. I could have every head bowed and every eye closed for just a few moments. If you're troubled We've seen in these words of uh, Paul that faith in Jesus Christ leads to obedience. And so there comes that question that may follow along with conviction is, is our obedience showing evidence of our professed faith in Jesus Christ? Because as I mentioned, not everyone who professes Jesus Christ possesses Jesus Christ. That is the demand of the gospel of God. Is that those who walk in faith also walk in obedience to Jesus Christ. The other part that we see here is that call of Christ. Is that no one can come to the Father unless He be drawn. And there are, particular, there are uh, appointed times that God calls to us those whom He had chosen to save out of this world, those who God knows will answer that call. There are appointed times for that call to be answered when God is drawn. Is today your appointed time? Is God drawing you today through His Son, Jesus Christ? Is Jesus calling you into saving faith? If you feel that drawing today, would you answer the call of the Lord? Would you choose you this day to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If you made that choice today, we'd love for you to, 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 to come forward and talk. But even if you choose not to, the reason we held on to those connect cards, if you choose chose today to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, would you mark that on your cards and just simply stick them in the bag so that we could get in contact with you and talk with you about the decision that you've made today? We have a time of altar call. If you'd like to come forward and speak to someone about that decision. But if you're here today, if you would just like to come forth and, uh, and if there's anything that you need to bring before the Lord or if you would just like to spend time with the Lord, the altars are open. Is there anyone that would come today? Is there anyone that would come?
God is good. He's greatly to be praised. And he's greatly to be served. Amen. Oh, one other quick announcement I want to make sure that we noted. Um, wanted to let all of you know in case there's any questions out there still. Uh, next Sunday, we will be having service. I understand that there's some that uh, may uh, already have plans to be going out of town or, or, or whatever other case there may be. But nonetheless... The purpose of Christmas is to praise and, and to, to worship and celebrate Jesus Christ. Amen. And there's no greater, no better place to be than in the house of the Lord to celebrate and to worship the Lord. Amen. And so I know that may cause, uh, give cause and rise to uh, some sacrifices on many folks' behalf to, to be able to be here. But we can either choose to celebrate the things that are reflections of Christ through the, the gift giving and the getting together and all the other things that we do or we can come and celebrate and worship Christ himself um, in the places he has established for us to do so. Amen. Uh, and all uh, throughout the history of the church here, uh, whenever it's fall on Sunday, we've always been open for service on Sunday, and that's not going to change. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will have service on Sunday, uh, and that's for each person to determine, you know, um, if they can be in this house or in God's house somewhere on Sunday to, to truly worship and celebrate Him. Mm -hmm. But as far as this place, uh, the doors will be open on Sunday for worship. Does anybody have anything else they want to add before we close? All right, no one? All right, let's uh, go, Lord, in prayer and we'll close that. Father, we thank you for your word today. Lord, we thank you for the wisdom and understanding, Father, Lord, that you've given all of us. Father, I pray that we uh, uh, have a better understanding, Father, Lord, about how it is, Lord, that you have come to call us the faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that I thank you that you've helped us to understand, Father, about how that faith leads us to produce the fruit of obedience in our lives. Not begrudgingly, Father, but joyfully. Before, Because before, Lord, we did not have a heart for you. But Lord, you've taken out that hard heart and you've given us a heart of flesh. A heart that understands your goodness, Lord, and your abundance of grace and mercy upon us, Father. And it's that heart, Father, Lord, that rejoices in who you are and what you've done for us. And it's that rejoicing heart, Father, that has a desire to follow after you and to serve you and to obey you, Father. And Lord, and I just pray that for all of us here, Lord, that... Uh, um, is walking in faith, Lord, that that faith is producing obedience in our lives, no matter what the consequences may be, Father. Lord, that you are first and you are supreme in all things, Lord, and that each day that we are deciding, Father, to follow you, to walk in obedience to you and your word, Father. Lord, and I just thank you, Father. I, I praise and rejoice you, Father, for for your great work in our lives. Lord, and I ask that as we go into this week to come, 
Lord, I pray for strength and I pray for health. Lord, I pray for boldness, Father, to live for You, to be a faithful witness for You. Lord, to share this gospel, this good news, with those that are around us, Father. Lord, that those that don't know You, Father, might come to know You. That they would join all of us, Father, in being that heavenly choir that sing praises, honor, and glory to You, Father, that gives You the, the, the honor and the praise that You so rightly deserve for Your abounding love for all of us. We just thank You in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.